Okay, so I just gave back the exams and I want to explain a little bit about how I um, calculate your grades. So um, each time you have an exam, if you look at the inside front cover of your exam book, um, what I do is I average in, I don't do a letter grade for the exam, I just do n numbers. And um, as you recall, we said that the homework was going to be worth one exam, and I figure you've done like one third of your homework so far. So I factored that in as one third of an exam, and then plus this exam, and then there's a total there. And then, uh, and then the, the letter grade that I have on the inside front cover of your book is the letter grade in the course, not for the exam, but it's, it's the average of the, it's, it's a weighted average of the, of the exam and the homework. And you guys, I will have to say, did really, really well. We had a perfect paper and a bunch, a couple in the 90s, and so I think, I think, but, but everybody's doing well. I, no one is in trouble. I think everybody, everybody can do, everybody can do well. Everybody who's in the class now, there's no problem, no problemo, okay? It's, okay. It's, it's not, no, 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 everybody's okay. I'm saying nobody, nobody's in trouble. I think everybody can do well. So, yeah, so you are, you are, you are a good group, a strong, strong math logic group. So we're going to look forward to great things. Um, and I, put, I, 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 think, I don't think there's too much need to go over any of the problems on the exam because um, I pretty much, um, if, there, if you missed a problem, I pretty much indicated how to do it. But if, 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 if I didn't do that on yours and you want, some, you want to talk about it, I'm, that's fine. Just come on by and we can... We can go over any of this stuff. The final exam is going to be cumulative. So it's important that you, if you are, are weak in any certain area with this one, that you learn from your mistakes and so that, you, so that you'll do well on the final exam. Okay, and you had a break from the homework last, over the weekend. But now we're ready to get back into it. And what we're going to do next is we're going to finish up chapter 3. There was a section in chapter 3 that was not on the exam. It was called Leibniz as an Axiom. So we're going to do, to do that today. But before we take a look at Leibniz as an Axiom, let's remember what Leibniz as an inference rule is. Okay? So, Leibniz as an inference rule. This marker doesn't seem to be very good. Oh, where's my trash? Hmm. <laughs> I hope this one's better. Yeah, that's better. Remember how Leibniz says an inference rule worked? It was this. It was x. If x equals y, we have the inference rule, and if we assume that x equals y in all states, then what we know that, so what, what were you saying, Josh? E with, e with z replaced by x equals e with z replaced by y. Okay? Now, Recall the meaning of this, um, here we go. Pass that back to Ben. So, um, recall now the meaning of an inference rule. What it says is that if you assume that this is true in all states, then you can do this textual substitution, right? So that's the meaning of this inference rule, okay? So if x equals y in all states, then we have this equality between these textual substitutions. The equality uh, follows. 
the, the quality of the conclusion follows, right? Now let's take a look at Leibniz as an axiom. So what does Leibniz as an axiom say? Well, if you have your sheets out, this is 3.83. And by the way, we have some new notation here. We have this, see, check it out up here. We have E, and then we have a superscript Z and a subscript capital X. And uh, this is a common abbreviation in formal methods for textual substitution. It's just a shorthand way to write textual substitution, okay? So that means E was Z replaced by X, okay? And what Leibniz as an axiom says is it puts it in the form of an implication. It says E equals F implies E with Z replaced by E equals E with Z replaced by F. Okay? But this is really this is really an abbreviation for it's, it's this is really an abbreviation. You can think of it like this: E equals F implies E with Z replaced by E equals E with Z replaced by F. All right. So this really means this because this is an abbreviation for textual substitution. Now, these things kind of look alike, but they are not quite the same. Because when you have an inference rule, what you do is you assume that this is true in all states. And if, this, if you assume that this is true in all states, then this one follows. This is not saying quite the same thing, because what this is saying is that if E equals F in some state, then this textual substitution, it implies this textual substitution in that same state. So let me jot that down. With, with Leibniz as an axiom, it says if E equals F in some state, if E equals F in some state. See, this one is in all states, but this one is in some state. The se well, that's the meaning of this that's the meaning of, of uh, that's just the meaning. Uh, if E equals F in some state, uh, the then the substitutions are equal in the same state. The substitutions are equal in the same state. Maybe, here, let me try to explain why that is. You know, um, see, look, when we did this, when, when we started, here, let's go back and look at some of these implications. Um, let's see. See if I can do a. Well, here, let's just take a look at weakening strengthening, 3.76a. All right? Whenever we write down in 3.76a, when we write P implies P or Q, we are not assuming that P is true in all states. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I mean, we're just, we're just not doing it. It's just P, if P, then. P or Q. Well, this is not an inference rule. This is an implication. This is the, the, the meaning, it's the meaning of how we defined inference rule. See, so this is, so this Leibniz as an axiom doesn't mean quite the same thing as Leibniz as an inference rule. This is two different concepts, I guess. It is. It's two, yeah, it's two different. Is that, yeah, but, but, but the inference rule of Leibniz does not mean the same thing as the axiom Leibniz. 
even though even though it looks very similar because this you can kind of use the words if you assume this is true in all state then it follows that and we know that in English we say the way we say this is if then but I mean if you I think the way to, to, to understand that this isn't the same is that if you look at 3.76 a if you look at P implies P or Q you're not saying P has to be true in all states it actually could be false and it would be Right, it, yeah, P, yeah, that's true. In fact, weakening the consequent in, in 3.76a, P implies P or Q, the whole thing is true in all states. Yeah. Right, yeah. because it's a tautology, it's, a, it's, a, it's valid, right? But, but it doesn't necessarily, but, you, but you, you, don't, you don't use it by assuming that P is true in all states. Yeah, you, you see what I mean? There, there are two different, yeah. two different ideas. Okay, so let's take a look now then. Um, so, you're, uh, so that's the axiom. Will we ever prove 3.83? No, no because possible. it's not possible because it's an axiom. Okay, so that's one of the ones that we just assume without proof. Why do they just start using equals here? Yeah, what, good question. What's the diff why do we start, the question is why do we start using equals here for E and F? Because what's the, what's the difference between equals and equivales? Yeah, there's the conjunctive meaning, and it's also good for what? It's also good for numbers. So in this case, this works for this even works for numbers, right, right. and so that's so we we want to we want to take that make that possibility. So you know, uh, frequently we will use equivale. I mean, frequently E and F it works for both numbers and booleans. So if you're ever doing it with booleans, you can just change the equals to equivales. Right. Are you with me on that? Yeah. Because equals works for both booleans and numbers. So because, but this axiom Leibniz, does, this is one of the few, one of the first ones. In fact, I guess it is the first one that also works for numbers. Yeah. See, because if e equals f, then that does imply that e was replaced by e equals e was replaced by f. Okay. Yeah, and that's and that's why this is also equals. But of course, if if you have, I mean, if these are boolean expressions then you can use this with equivales here and equivales here. You can't, you're allowed to do that. You're allowed... You know how like the first like five theorems we basically defined um, equivales? Why haven't we like defined equals yet? Oh, now good, oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, no, that, that yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, that's a very good question. The question is why have we always been using equivales and not equals? Because with proposition, huh? Wasn't yeah. Oh, okay. Say your question again. My uh, question is, you know how, like, since we've been using e previous theorems to prove that each theorem as we go, right? Yes. And the first thing we did was define equivales. Yes. How are we going to be able to prove these other theorems based off just this axiom Leibniz? That's the he said we can. We, we can basically just defined equals here as well. Remember that equals and equivales have the same truth table when they apply to booleans. Yeah. But this is a more general, this is the first axiom that we have that is more general in that it works for numbers also. Yeah. But you understand that the previous ones that we did with equivales, those don't apply to numbers. You can't yeah. say five implies yeah. something because five is not a boolean expression. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So do you have still a question? I guess it might be answered as we start to prove like substitution replacement truth. Okay, okay. I hope. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if, if, if when we go along, if this will be made any more clear because... Um, How do you prove substitution A? Uh, okay. Let's do it. <laughs> He's my plant. <laughs> he said, how would you prove... Uh, uh, substitution. Before we do that substitution, let me give you an example. So we'll we'll do this. We'll we will prove um, we'll prove that one. Let me give an example of uh, 3.8 just to show you how what it means. Let me give you an example of 3.83. Suppose E is the expression x and z. And so what does this say? 
what does this say? E equals, little e equals f implies what? Yeah, so so what yeah, so what is that? Go ahead and do that. X and E must what? Equal value. Wait, are we on are we on substitution A? Uh no, three point eighty three. Axiom Leibniz. Okay. Three point eighty three. So so um, so is equal to uh, Uh, maybe the parentheses are unnecessary. Yep. Oh, well, but now this is equals, not equal All right. Uh, yes. But no, wait. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, this is this is equals, yeah, not equals. We're using we're using equals here, so I think we do need parentheses. Yeah, yeah. Are we good? Well, that's he says that's stupid that it's a well. I mean, that's just the way it is. I might mention that, that, that different, different logic systems have different, they, the authors define different parentheses, but one, uh, different uh, precedence tables, but once you define your precedence table, you have to stick with it throughout. But anyway. Why do they all have the same precedence table? Uh, yeah, you know, I don't know why everybody doesn't agree on the on our standard. It's just, I don't know, every time somebody. Yeah, it's one of those small yeah exactly. Why doesn't everybody speak? Latin. We should all speak Latin. <laughs> uh, no thanks. No, no thanks. <laughs> Does everybody see this? So E equals F implies X and E equals X and F. Here's another one. What about suppose E is um, X and Z. Oh, this is kind of trivial, I guess. Or Y. So this would be equal, uh, easy. So then E equals F would imply what? X and E equals X and F or Y, right? And doesn't this make sense from what you're used to in, math, in, in algebra? You know, if this equals this, then you can substitute equals for equals. Basically, that's what it's saying. Yeah. Only now it's in the form of an axiom. Okay, so now let's see how, let's go ahead and prove 3.84a. And I'll show you here how we can, because 3.84a has, um, see, now what's, what, that's one thing we notice that's different about 3.84a. And 3.83, it's an equivalent. So now what we're doing is, yeah, yeah. So now what we're doing is we're using the equals, I mean, we're using the fact that equals works for both Booleans and numbers, and we're going to use it for Booleans because this has an and in it, right? This has an and, this, this, this has an and with this expression. So now we're going to be using it for. substitution only works for Booleans. I use this in the case wh where it was with booleans, yeah. Uh, but I mean like 3.84 only works for booleans. 3.84a only works for E being a boolean expression. Okay, yeah. only works for capital E being a boolean expression, but little e and little f could be numbers. Okay. Because the yeah. boolean exp See? because if you have a boolean expression like this, um, like if you say, um, but. Suppose you say z is less than 5. Now notice that this whole thing is a Boolean expression, but z is, is a number. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah I am fine, but isn't, isn't Leibniz, can, cannot, can't the expression e be a number in Leibniz? Or it, doesn't it could be, but when we do 3.84a, we see Why because of, we see because of this and that you can only do an and with a Boolean expression. <coughs> Look, check, check, okay, here I know what this do. Sense, here, let, here, let, let me do an, let me do an example. Let me do an example of 3.84a. Let's let's do 3.84a example. Let's suppose that E is 
the expression um, z is less than 5. Now you understand that z is a number, but this is a Boolean expression. So, so what uh, 3.84a says, that it says that e equals f and e with z replaced e and e with z replaced by e equals e equals f and e with what? c replaced by f. So what does this say? This says if e equals f and e w and and e is less than 5. Yeah, this says this says that e equals f and e is less than 5 equivails what? E equals f, f and f. f is less than 5. Yeah. Are we good? We proved that. So now, yeah, we have now what we what we want to do is we want to prove 3.84a. Yeah. So let's prove it. So let me show let's show you how to how how to prove it. Okay, so proof of 3.84a. Now, here's what we're going to do. We are going to start with the whole thing and get it to a previously proved. Yeah? Yeah. Because... Because you need to have equals. Yeah. So we're going to have... We're going we're gonna to do uh, E equals F and E equals F and E with uh, Z replace E equals E equals F and... E was replaced by F. Well, obviously, what are we going to have to get it to? <laughs> I mean, what, what are we going to? Axiom. Yeah, obviously, we're going to have to get it to. I mean, there's only one thing. <laughs> it's, it's the first thing. Yeah, we're going to have to get it. Does anybody have any ideas how the heck we're going to do that? Yeah. Uh, you have an idea? What, what else? I mean, what else? How can we manipulate this thing? At, I mean, how? I'll give you a hint. How are you going to get back the, uh, the second e? Oh, wait, no. I'll give you a hint. It's on the screen. Is distributivity of, uh, implies over equal? Uh, no, because, no, because we have implies on both sides and we don't have any implies here. Okay, but how are you going to get the second equals in Leibniz? Yeah, good question. How do you Good question. That's, that's it's a not, mystery. That's my original question. You just pull it equals out thin air. It doesn't make sense. Well, look, w uh, we can replace equals with equivales when we're dealing with, because this one deals with a Boolean expression. E is a Boolean expression. So we, in our proof, we can say replace equals with equivales. What about the reverse? Replace equivales with equivales. Well, that's harder. Well, that's what we're doing. Is it? Yeah, because you need to grab an equal. Let's make it oh, wait, 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 wait. Maybe, maybe I was mistaken about that. No, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm sorry. You can go either way. Yeah, you can, because they have the same truth table. <laughs> no, 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 no. These are all Booleans. I might as well have left the axiom as Boolean only just to make it simple. And you're not just pulling a rabbit out of the hat. Well, uh, Sometimes you have to pull a rabbit out of a hat. But anyway, somebody said it. Somebody said the right one here. Shunting. I don't think shunting because you, shunting, we've got implies here. Here we don't have any implies. Uh, well, but we don't have any implies, so we can't use three, our friend 3.59. Somebody said it. I forget who said it. No, somebody said I don't remember who said it just a second ago. 
Well, look, what do we have? Okay, all right. No, no, look, but what do we have? We have something and something equals the same thing and something else. 3.66. There, finally. Are you with me? No. Look at the pattern. Look, we have something and something equal equals the same thing and something else. So this equals by 3.62. What? Um, Leibniz but with an equal balance. Equals E equals F. Yeah, it equals. So it's E equals F. Implies. Implies what? Uh, e replaced, or E was Z replaced by E. E was Z replaced by E. Uh, is equal to. Equals. E was Z replaced by F. Or equal values, right? Okay. Okay, so this equals, and so what we can do now is we can say replace equal values with equals. Because after all, equals works for, with both Boolean and numbers, right? And we have a Boolean here, so we can replace this with equals. Are you with me? So we can say, so we can say E equals F implies E with Z replaced by E, little e, equals E with Z replaced by F. And now we can just do what? What's your friend? Who's your, what do you like to do? Oh, sorry. Friend. And now we can do, yeah, RUP. Now we can do RUP, and what do we get? E equals F implies E Z replaced by E equals E with Z replaced by F, which is what? Which is what? Which is 3.83. Here? Oh, I forgot to. Um, oh, that's right. That's right. Ooh, I, minus two points for me. Yeah, I would take off for that because we have necessary. These are necessary, right? Which is three, boom, we're done. All right. So does everybody see how that how that works? So now for Thursday, so we just did three point eighty four a. For Thursday, you're going to prove 3.85a, which is replaced by true. Replaced by true. Yeah. So P implies E with Z replaced by P equals P replaced uh, P implies E with Z replaced by true. And you're also going to prove for me 3.85b. Q and P implies E was replaced by P equals Q and P implies E was replaced by true. So don't get thrown by this new little notation, the proofs all work just like, you know, we did before, using all of our same rules that we did before. Okay? Yeah. Now, um... Do you recommend that we start with one side, or do we do the thing? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, to, tell you the truth, I, to tell you the truth, I don't remember. All right, that's fine. Move on. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. You just give it a shot and see what you come up with. I want to, before we go on to the next chapter, I want to, there's this one called Shannon that's an interesting one. And we're going to use uh, the con this concept of Shannon. Um, what it says is that E with Z replaced by P equals P and E was Z replaced by true, or not P and E was Z replaced by false. Yeah, like well, it's, e, well, here's how we're going to use it. It's good, this is going to be the, the this is going to be the, the um, justification for what's called proof by case analysis. And, uh, 
And so what we'll do is, we, what we'll do is if you prove, if you prove P and E was replaced by true, and if you prove uh, not P and E was replaced by false, you have proved E was replaced by P. So what this lets us do is this lets us do the proof in two parts. There will be a case where we do it with P being true, and there will be a case where we do it with P being false. And then if we do both of those cases, then we know it's true for any P, whether P is true or false. So that, that's going to be the basis of what we call case analysis in the next chapter. You'll like case analysis. In fact, people, in fact, students like case analysis so much that I have to, that I have to for, forbid them from using it in all the proofs from now on because, if, because they, they, they just go hog wild anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually, it is a little bit like truth tables because you do, you know, all possible combinations. Well, what you can do is you can pick one of those variables and do it for both combinations of that. So it's, it's on the road to proof by truth tables. And we don't generally get, we don't generally like that as well. But it is a technique that sometimes you have to resort to. Okay, so that ends chapter three. And now what we are going to do in the next chapter is we are going to learn some different proof techniques. I mean, we'll, we will learn a few, well, actually, there's a, a few really important theorems that we're going to, to do. But we are going to... Um, to learn some proof techniques. Um, actually, let me, and, and the first um, proof technique is proving implications. Now, um, you guys know how one of the first proof techniques that we did, we said, the very first proof technique we did is we said, in order to prove something, you have to get it equal, the whole thing equal to a previously proved one, right? But then we said, well, now wait a minute. If the thing that you're trying to prove has an equivalence in it, instead of getting the whole thing to a previously proved one, you could just do what? One get one side, yes. prove it to the other side, right? Well, as it turns out, we have the same kind of technique that we can use for implications. All right? Now, to show you how this works in algebra, and to, uh, to show you that there, there's an, an analogous thing with algebra. So let me ask you this. Suppose you know that A equals B and B is less than C. What do you know about A and C? Suppose you know that, suppose you know that A equals B and you also know that B is less than C. What do you know about A and C? A is less than C. It's kind of a transitivity, but the thing about the transitivity is that you have an equals here and a less than here. But it still works. I mean, you know. Are you with me? And suppose you also know that C equals D, and you also know that D is less than or equal to F. Or let's just keep it less than. Aren't you, aren't you substituting equals or equals? Well, but you're doing but you but you're doing less than because the, if you know a equals b and b is less than c, you know that what a is what less than, less than no no no. If you know a equals b and b is less than c, you know what a is less, a is less than c. Less than c. Less but if you know a is less than c and c equals d, you know a is what less than, less than d. But if you know that a is less than d and d is less than f, what do you know? A is less than, a is less than f. Now look. You, you, does everybody understand that suppose you know that F is greater than G. Now, is there anything you can say about A and G? No. No, because all, this string has to be either equals, less than, equals, less than. But once you switch it and you have a greater than, then all bets are off. So you don't know anything. about A, a could be less than G or it could be greater than G because it depends on how much bigger... F is than G, right? Is everybody clear on this? Yeah. How this works ar arithmetically? Now let me show you how you would do a proof 
using the less thans with numbers. So suppose you know, suppose you know um, that A equals B and B is less than C, B is less than C and C equals D. And here's, how, here's what you could do. You can prove that A is less than D as follows. You can prove A is less than D by the following steps. So here's what you would do. You would, here's how you would put it in our format, in our proof style. What you would do is you would start off with A, right? And now, and we, but we know that A equals B, right? So we could say this equals by virtue of the fact that we know A equals B, you know, assuming that this is a previous theorem, right? You would say A equals what? B, right? Are you with me? This is just how we would normally do it, okay? But then you would say that B is what? So you would, instead of putting equals here, what would you put? Is less than by virtue of the fact that B is less than C, B would be less than what? C. Are you with me? And then you're saying, and then we're saying, ah, but we know that C equals D. So this, so C, because we're saying A equals B, B is less than C, and now we're saying what? C what? Equals by virtue of the fact that C equals D, D. And this is how you would put it in our style. Why don't you just start with B is less than C and substitute A in for B and That's what we're doing. We're substituting A. That's, that's what we're doing. We're substituting. Then, then you can use equals on the left column. You don't need the less than You still end up. Yeah, but just bear with me because this is going, because I want to show you how, how you use this right. in place of equals. Are you with me? Got it. Now, and by doing this, how do we know then that A is less than D? Because we know that equals, okay, so because we know that equals and less than are what's called, quote, mutually transitive. You understand what we're saying? Yeah. Mutually transitive means if A is less than B and B equals C, then A is less than C. That's what mutual trans... And if A, you know, all combinations, right? Yeah. Because because we know that equals and less than are mutually transitive, it follows that A is less than D. We conclude A is less than D. Now watch this, you guys. Let's go back to 3.82. We have a set, a, a series of theorems here. What does 3.82 tell us? Yeah, and not only that, but not only that, P implies Q and Q implies R implies P implies R, but not only that, but if, if both, so if both of these are implies, then what? Then the first one implies the last one, the third one. But if, if one of them is equals and the other one is implies, it's still what happens? The first one implies the last one. And if the first one is implies and the second one is equivails, still what happens? The first one implies the last one. It, they are uh, mutually transitive, yeah. Well, well, I'm just using the terminology from our author, you know. Sometimes I change the names of these a little bit. 
In fact, I think our author doesn't have this weakening the consequent, strengthening the antecedent, and weakening strengthening. So I sometimes I expand the names. Maybe I should call this mutual mutual transitivity. It's good because it, it is a mutual transitivity. Okay, and not only that, but what if both of them are equivales? Now this one's not in the book, but what if both of them are equivales? P equals Q and Q. P equals Q and Q equals that does imply that P equals R. Are you with me? So, what does this say we can do? What this says we can do is we can start, if we want to prove an implication, we can have something equals something implies something equals something, and what have we done? The first one does what? implies the last one. And so now what we're saying is this gives us, using, using this, this gives us the ability to, to mix implies in here at one or more steps. And we can, and that's one way to prove implications by starting with side and getting it to the other. And you can start with either side. The only thing is if you start, if you start with the consequent then what do you get? Instead of getting an implies in here, what do you get? A follows from, because that's just the other way around. Yay. Are you with me? Uh, Are you with me? Uh, okay, let's do an example. I'm, boy, you, I'm, this is really good. <laughs> Every time where it's about time to do something, uh, Josh says, okay, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> He's my plant. All right. You're a plant. I get it. You know, like I planted you and I paid you 10 bucks before I say, hey, when it comes to this point, you say this and we'll. All right. <laughs> okay. So, uh, 4.1 is a nice theorem about implication. P implies Q implies P. We'll come back to that in a minute. For, for right now, let's prove monotonicity of OR, 4.2. And we're going to do it using this style, using this, uh, starting with one side and getting it to the other. So proof, now this is kind of tricky. Proof of 4.2. And, and now usually what's, which side do you get to which side? When you're, the bigger side. Yeah, the most complicated side. So which is more complicated, the, the right. an, an, antecedent or the consequent? The consequent is more complicated. So we're going to get the consequent to do what? Not to imply P implies Q, but to what? Follow to follow from. Is everybody, yeah. are you with me? We're going to get it to follow from. So we're, so we'll just, and, if, and if we just write down the consequent by itself, now we don't need the parentheses, right? Because we don't. So P or R implies Q or R. P or R implies Q or R. Now, usually, who's our friend? 3.59. On the other hand, this time, our friend is going to be 3.57. So who wants to go first? I'll tell you. Equals, uh, this equals by 3.57. Uh, so Ben, you want to go, you want to tell us what this is using 3.57? I don't think we're going to have, we're, get, we're getting rid of, the, of this implies using 3.57. Oh, okay, so P. Are you with me? P or R or Q or R. Okay, P or R or Q or R. Equals P or R. Or, sorry, um, Q or R. Q or R. Does everybody follow this? Yeah. yeah. Equivales Q or R. Mm -hmm. By symmetry. Because because it equivails the consequent, not by, the antecedent. By, by symmetry of or, does that matter? Well, you can't. The p <laughs> symmetry just says you can oh, flip these around, but this has to be q. Symmetry, the other or, and then r or r equals. Assuming I use symmetry of or before I use three point five seven, would that be okay? No, having this be p. No, no, no. Yes. No. 
Because symmetry would just be R or Q. No, okay. Yeah. It'd still be a Q. Q the, the consequent, the, it has to equal veil. 3.57 says it has to equal veil the consequent. Uh, okay. Are you with me? Okay, that makes sense. The consequent is not the same as the antecedent. You can't. I was, I was, I was Okay, okay. Is everybody, is everybody clear on this? Well, now, what, what do we see right away? Let's get rid of the, uh, one of them. Yeah, but I think we want, what are we trying to get this, what are we trying to work ourselves towards? Uh, We're trying to, P and plus, yeah, oh, so, well, maybe, well, I know, but, eventually, eventually we will. But what do we have here? A P or R or Q or R. Does this look kind of... Oh, yeah. Mason, what do you think? P or because because yeah. if you, by symmetry, you can get, get these R's together. Right. And then what happens if you have R or R? Do you remember that? Uh, 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 wait, ho which... Uh, ho hold on, hold on, hold on, Ma Mason. Uh, which number is it? Well, I mean, either the number or the name. Do you remember the name? Uh, R or R? Idempotent. Yes, it's idempotent. Very good. So this equals by symmetry. Well, let's, we don't have to say symmetry. We know that one. Um, so by idempotent. Uh, idempotent C of or. So that would be, and so let's just take this R over here, and then R or R is R, right? So that's P or Q or R equal veils Q or R. Oh, Rochelle, this looks like a pattern. This looks like some kind of a pattern, only it's on the other side. It's on the right side instead of the left side, but we know by symmetry. Because what do we have here? A bunch of ors and a what? And an equal veils. We have some ORs with some equivales, and we have OR R, OR R with an equivales. And oh. uh, we have a pattern here. What's the pattern that we remember the pattern? What does what over what? What does what over what? Maybe. Do you remember that one? You don't really, oh, come on, you guys. I just got through saying how strong you were with all your perfect papers on this exam, and now you don't even remember the, what distributes, uh, come on, what distributes over what? Or distributes over equal veils. Can you find that one for me? Uh, 27, yeah, 27. So this equals by... 3.27, so, so what, here we have something or R equal something or R. So what can we do with the or R? No, no. We can, we, yeah, we can, just, we can factor it out. This is, like, this is like factoring out. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah. Look, this is like an algebra. You know, look. How about this? You know, you know that A times B plus C times B, what does this equal? This equals A plus B times C. And what is this? A plus C, that's what I said, A plus C times B. And this is called factoring out, right? Yeah. It's the opposite of going, you know, distributing it. It's factoring. So do you see what to factor out here? Do you see what, do you see what to factor out here? Yes. <laughs> well, so what do we factor out here? So what do we factor out? Oh, well, no, we don't factor out. We're just going to factor out R. R. So if we factor out R, what do we get? P or Q or R. Yeah, we get P or Q. 
No. no. What? Or, or Boy, I've, I've, I've got you. I've got, I've got all of you guys stumped. I have you all stumped. This is good. Your hinting is just really bad. Well, come on. It's A and B, or A times B plus C times B. You factor out the B. Because why? Because multiply distributes over addition. Equivales Q, good, finally. Equivales Q, parentheses, come on. Yes, yes. Or R. Can we, oh geez, I did not realize, I did not realize that this was, I did not realize this was going to be such a stumbling, uh, barrier. We factored out the R. Well, or distributes over equivales. Well, I mean, it's on this side. It's on this side instead of this side, but we're using symmetry in our head now, right? Yeah. That's ridiculous. No, it's not ridiculous. It's good. No, it's ridiculous. Oh, rats. Right in the middle of this super cool proof, when we just got to this point, our time is out. So we're going to start, we're going to start right here next uh, tomorrow morning. Awesome. See you. Awesome.